Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Fiber for Breakfast. We're now in our 36th episode of 2022. Um, before we kick off, I'd like to thank our sponsors of Fiber for Breakfast, including our gold sponsors, Graybar and Vetro. You know, last week I had the privilege of being at Mesa Community College just outside of Phoenix with Wendell Weeks, the CEO of Corning, and John Stanky, the CEO of AT&T, for the announcement of the new Corning optical cable plant. As many of you may have heard me say, the U.S. manufactured 102 million miles of fiber last year, and we actually exported 37 million miles of optical glass. So while we have lots of optical fiber, our supply chain challenges are related to the shortages in resin, steel, and the materials that make up the physical cable that protects and supports the optical fiber. This new Corning plant is going to be up in full production in time for the NTI B um, rollout. And so that supply uh, of optical cables is desperately needed for our national fiber deployment. So joining us at this event last week was Commerce Secretary Raimondo and Senator Kelly, as you guys probably know, famous Senator Kelly. Um, both gave very passionate and heartfelt speeches that emphasize the significance of this optical cable plant and the positive impact that the rollout of fiber broadband is going to have on our nation for generations to come. You know, I continually be, continue to be extremely impressed with Secretary Romando. Her passion, energy, and resolve are contagious. You know, I left Phoenix on just on, on steroids, you know, listening to Secretary Romando. And after hearing her last week, I'm extremely confident that she will hold the line for fiber and ensure that our efforts on deploying fiber broadband to every American will be successful. Speaking of success, our next regional Fiber Connect workshop is in Columbus, Ohio on November 3rd. It appears that this workshop will even beat our records from Copper Mountain, so you're not going to want to miss it, so register today. Today, um, we have a very special Fiber for Breakfast with Nate Denny the Deputy Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Information Technology's Broadband and Digital Equity Division, discussed broadband and digital equity in North Carolina. You know, I've spent the majority of my life in North Carolina. All my family lives there, as does my wife's. Both and I, my wife and I went to college in North Carolina, and we still have a lake home there. So North Carolina holds a very special place in our hearts, and I'm excited to hear about the great things that Nate and his team are doing to close the digital divide. Before I formally introduce today's guest, though, I'd like to introduce Trish Ehlers from our team. We haven't forgot about her, even though she was on vacation for a whole week. Um, and he's, she's going to walk us through some housekeeping items. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. And good morning to everyone who's joined us this morning. It's great to be back. Before I go over a few logistical items, I'd like to thank our Fiber for Breakfast sponsors once again, Gray Bar and Vetro. Now, if everyone would please keep in mind that you're all in listen mode only to ask a question, you can just type it into the question box located within your control panel on the right side of your screen. Gary will host a Q&A session with our panelists at the end of today's webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be available to members only on FBA's website within 24 hours. You can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. At the conclusion of the presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a very brief feedback survey. If you could take a minute to do so, we really appreciate your input. I'll pass it back to Gary now to introduce our panelists and get us started. Gary? Thanks, Trish, and good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, the president and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. You know, last week the, for Fiber for Breakfast, we discussed new evidence, and then fiber broadband is changing lives with the Fiber Broadband Association's leadership of our technology committee, which is John George, Debbie Kish, and Mike Render. John, Debbie, and Mike walked us through the latest Fiber Broadband Association survey results that highlighted how fiber broadband is truly changing lives. Today, we're going to do a deep dive with Nate Denny, the Deputy Se Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Information Technology's Broadband and Digital Equity Division, discuss broadband and digital equity in North Carolina. Nate Denny was named Deputy Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Information Technology's Broadband and Digital Equity Division in May 2021. He previously served as the NCDIT's Chief of Staff and Legislative Director before joining NCDIT in 2017, Nate was a presidential appointee 
at the U.S. General Services Administration in Washington, D.C., where he served as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Senior Advisor for Congressional Affairs. With all that, welcome, Nate. And uh, for our audience, please type in your questions as we go, and we'll get them in at the Q&A at the end of um, Nate's presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Nate. Well, thank you, Gary. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and the time uh, to talk to your members here today. You know, in North Carolina, Governor Cooper has uh, committed in a big way to, to building a state of digital equity in uh, across our state. We've got more than one million North Carolinians on the wrong side of the digital divide now, uh, meaning course that they either don't have access to a high-speed internet connection, they uh, uh, can't afford the service, they don't have the devices they need, or the digital skills and literacy to really participate in the modern economy. And you know, it's funny, Governor Cooper has a, a, a mission statement that I think guides uh, work across his administration, and it's to build a North Carolina uh, that is better educated, healthier, uh, where North Carolinians have more money in their pockets and can live lives of, of purpose and abundance. And thinking through that mission statement, uh, a high-speed internet connection and the tools to take advantage of it are really critical to, to hitting each of those points. And I think we learned that during the pandemic, right? Uh, I think it was evident before, but the message really came home during uh, a major economic and public health crisis that uh, everyone had uh, kids that were trying to learn from home, folks were trying to learn how to do their jobs from home, access telemedicine services, um, uh, access government benefits like unemployment or look for new jobs, particularly jobs that don't exist in your hometown, you know, uh, and, and North Carolina, with its diverse, uh, uh, with its large size, significant rural populations and uh, diverse features and people, I think has, has many small communities that need this tool, right, to be able to fully participate in the modern economy. So Governor Cooper said, let's put uh, our American Rescue Plan uh, allocation for the state of North Carolina to work to connect everybody. Can we please uh, bump the slide forward? Let's go two more. I think this one's animated, but let's go ahead and get all the bullets out there. So, so again, Governor Cooper wanted to build a plan using our American Rescue Plan resources to address each one of these major issues, right? To make sure that folks have access to the infrastructure they need, make sure they can afford it, and make sure they have the tools they need to take advantage of it. Next slide, please. And he set really specific goals for that plan across each of those points. We want to make sure by 2025 that 98% of North Carolinians have, uh, North Carolina households have access to a high speed internet connection. We want an 80% subscription rate statewide. We want to make sure that that's not just a statewide average. We want to make sure that our investments are felt across different communities. Right now in North Carolina, white households subscribe at a rate of about 76%. Black, Latino, and Native American households each lag considerably behind that. So we've got to make specific and targeted investments to, to get everyone up to that 80% number in those communities. And then I think most importantly, we want a 100% subscription rate for households with uh, school children. We want to permanently get rid of what's known as the homework gap in North Carolina. Next slide. And again, North Carolina received five and a half billion dollars from the American Rescue Plan's state uh, local recovery uh, fund. And uh, we have devoted more than a billion of that allocation to this problem. We've got nearly a billion in infrastructure funding alone across several major programs, including the state's existing great grant. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with how much legislatures like coming up with good acronyms. This is the Growing Rural Economies with Access to Technology Fund that uh, incentivizes deployments to unserved rural parts of the state. Uh, and then that, that uh, program got more than $350 million. And we created 
a range of new programs because we needed more flexible tools to really address needs across North Carolina. We've got a new procurement program that allows the state to partner directly with county governments and use their rescue funds uh, to go straight to the market and ask internet providers to address unserved and underserved parts of a county uh, that have been left behind. I think one of the strengths of our great grant program is that it, it's been up and running for a number of years now. It's very prescriptively scored, right? An internet provider says where they want to serve. They come to us with an application. We score it on 14 different criteria. We spit out a score that generates a match. There's no strategy in that, right? And so we knew if we were really going to connect everyone in North Carolina, if we really wanted to make sure that each of these communities could attract businesses, uh, that, that their uh, employees could develop the skills necessary to be a strong workforce, that we had the education resources we needed, we would need more, uh, more strategic tools, more flexible tools. And so, we'll, again, we'll just work directly together to generate a request for proposals and build a statewide convenience contract that allows these communities to go straight to pre-qualified providers uh, to, to address their needs. We've got an even more flexible pot uh, known as the stopgap solutions of $90 million intended to address areas that, that don't get addressed by the two major infrastructure programs, right, where there are little pockets left behind. This could address uh, particularly high cost fiber segments, line extension needs uh, in rural communities, financing uh, a tower that can host fixed wireless equipment. Um, uh, downtown Wi-Fi projects, really a wide range of possible projects that are um, more narrowly targeted than uh, a massive fiber deployment um, uh, in areas where those deployments will be too costly or take too long to execute to really address community needs. We've got a $100 million pole replacement fund uh, intended to drive down the obstacle of, of costs for replacing utility poles there. And then we've got a million dollars to accurately map the scope of the problem across North Carolina. We spend a lot of time talking about infrastructure. Obviously, the Fiber Broadband Association is uh, 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 primarily interested in deployment of fiber as well. But we, you know, we know that it's not enough to just run a line through someone's front yard, right? If they can't afford it or don't have a laptop or a tablet at home. Uh, or don't have any skills. So we've also got $50 million to use to raise awareness of the Affordable Connectivity Program, help make sure that North low-income North Carolinians uh, have access to those resources and know where they can go to subscribe, uh, to, to get low-income households the devices they need and build uh, local capacity to address, uh, to, to, to create the kinds of skills development programs and trainings that they need to make sure everyone across the state uh, uh, can build skills and hit those subscription numbers that we need as well. Next slide. I mentioned the great grant program first, that, that incentive program, that was a $350 million program. Uh, I'm pleased to say that as of last week, we have now awarded $260 million of that program uh, across 92 counties. Uh, you see there's three different shades of blue here for three different uh, deployments. But through these funds, we're going to connect more than 115,000 new households and businesses across the state of North Carolina. All of those projects are fiber deployments. All of them require the internet provider uh, that is the recipient of the grant to participate in the affordable connectivity program. Um, we're really excited about these, these projects and, and the, the breadth of investments that we've been able to generate uh, through, uh, through this program. In addition to the $260 million in North Carolina's American Rescue Plan funds, uh, these projects are generating more than $120 million in uh, private sector matching funds to invest in these projects as well. So uh, this is really a transformative once in a lifetime you know, level of investment in North Carolina that we're seeing. And uh, of course, this is all in advance of the additional funding that'll come through President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law 
through the BEAD program and additional Digital Equity Act programs that, that North Carolina intends to take advantage of as well. Next slide. I mentioned this completing access to broadband program, the county partnership. Again, we will work directly with counties to accurately map unserved and underserved parts of uh, communities across the county and go directly out to market. Uh, now that we've issued the bulk of our great grant awards, we will launch this in the near future. We'll go, we'll make sure counties have know that they have a chance to use these funds to address unfunded great grant applicants that the counties have generated or worked to, to develop in partnership with an internet provider. Um, and again, I think this program will be uh, a much more impactful tool because the communities will be directly engaged. And, and I think that's a, a really important collaboration, especially going in to the BEAD program, which you know we'll see uh, next year when we start getting those funds, that community coordination piece is really critical to maximizing their impact and making sure that everyone in North Carolina has that connection. Next slide. And of course, your members are familiar with these numbers, but this is just our breakdown of, uh, of the additional Infrastructure Act funding that uh, uh, portions of which will come to North Carolina. We were uh, very proud to have Secretary Romando announce the notice of funding opportunity for the BEAD program, the Middle Mile program, and the Digital Equity programs here in North Carolina with Governor Cooper back in May. Uh, North Carolina immediately signaled our intent to participate in both the digital equity programs and the BEAD planning programs. We don't know yet what North Carolina's allocation will be, but I think because we are kind of going big with American Rescue Plan funds on the front end, I think we've really got an opportunity to connect everyone between these two uh, uh, infusions of federal funding. Next slide. And then, yeah, I've already mentioned the, the community, community coordination element here, but uh, again, I think where North Carolina is, is, is well positioned to capitalize on the BEAD program is the, the existence of really engaged communities of advocates, uh, local stakeholders, county and municipal governments, a really strong set of, uh, of internet providers that are already making major investments, uh, both uh, as part of a match for public projects and uh, for their own, you know, using their own resources, their own expansions of networks. Uh, we've got a really strong participating telephone membership and electric membership co-op community here that is uh, that received a number of awards through our great grant program. And all of these stakeholders, I think, working together will give us an opportunity to, one, draw down the maximum amount of federal funds, but then also build smart projects that actually benefit the communities where those projects are located. And, and so I, I guess just in closing, I would say um, uh, we're very excited about the opportunity. I think Governor Cooper has been uh, laser focused on building this complete state of digital equity, making the right investments, not just in infrastructure, but in the in devices, addressing affordability uh, across the board. So I think we're, we're very well positioned to, to um, uh, have the broadest possible impact here with these funds and appreciate the Fiber Broadband Association's uh, leadership and advocacy and, and having us here to talk about that plan and look forward to taking any questions, Gary. Thank Nate. Um, and um, I think uh, some of our members know that we're going to be doing on our regional events early next year in Raleigh. So we're looking forward to seeing yeah. you in person. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, so BEAD, you know, so you have a, um, you know, with the great, a great program in front of you, right, with um, ARPA and so forth. Um, so what is, and, and then you didn't mention, I don't think you mentioned ARDOF. You have some ARDOF awards coming. So where, what do you think your allocation is going to be for BEAD? 
Obviously, we are waiting to see what the mapping process uh, looks like um, and, and what our share of the our formula share of, of bead funding looks like. I think we can reasonably expect um, north of 800 million additional dollars through the bead program uh, funneled into our existing infrastructure programs. You mentioned the great grant and the, you know, I, I think these programs we've already created and built will be the, the model we drive our bead funding into, right? Uh, we've got proven models here. I think what we'll see as we go through the billion dollars of spending with the American Rescue Plan projects, we'll get data back that tells us which of these programs work best. I think that, that's, that's how we wanna make our decisions, you know, as, as we try to be, uh, 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 you know, sharp stewards of taxpayer resources we want to make sure we're driving funding into the most effective programs. I suspect that we're going to see that the, the programs that maximize uh, local participation build the best projects. But again, we'll have to see what, what the data looks like. I think our General Assembly has uh, already authorized dividing up bead funding between the Great Grant Program, the, CA the Completing Access to Broadband County RFP Program, and the stopgap solutions program, which will address the highest cost, um, uh, hardest to connect portions of North Carolina's uh, uh, population, I think consistent with beads, 10% set aside for the for the high cost locations there. But but how those allocations shape out, I think really will, should be driven by the data we get back through our programs. So the other thing I noticed is on your like $206 million award to 69 counties with the great um, grant, uh, the, it looked like you were pretty, um, had a great representation of service providers, you know, from, it looked like there was like 10 uh, recipients from AT&T to um, electric co-ops to um, Lumos and the, the, you know, charter of the cable companies. And so it, it seemed like you had a very broad representation of providers doing fiber is that yeah that's right i think we've got 15 different recipients uh through the three different uh, uh rounds that we funded with federal funding so far um again some uh, a handful of you know massive publicly traded companies that participate you mentioned several we've got a really strong uh set of regional and local providers we definitely had handful of both electric membership co-ops and telephone co-ops uh, participate in those programs. All of them are fiber projects, right? Uh, but but I, I think we believe that uh, North Carolina, if we really want to connect everyone, if we really want to uh, uh, deliver cost-effective projects and be good stewards of resources, we need a really diverse range of participants. Uh, in our programming. And, and I should point out that I, I think in North Carolina, uh, if we really want to connect everybody quickly too, we're going to need a broad range of types of projects too, right? So I think we'll see through the stopgap solutions and through some state funding that we've also uh, uh, invested in these programs, additional resources for fixed wireless providers. We've got a, pro we've got a pilot project for uh, low Earth orbit satellite providers as well. We really want everybody at the table, right, to, to um, uh, have the, the broadest range of options for North Carolina residents, which is really what it comes down to at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the uh, low Earth orbit satellites because I, I don't think that provides a path to the future for anybody. But, um, you know, so hopefully we can get a terrestrial service to those people. So it, it, it is it is not a standalone fix all right but it is i want the longest menu available right for for north carolina residents well absolutely so one of the questions came from audiences it says it looks like connect holding is a major part of the great grant program is the state working directly with the grant recipients to ensure they are successful Yes, we uh, we work very closely with grantees. Uh, we have uh, protections built in. So uh, the Great Grant Program is a, a, a cash reimbursement program, right? And so we don't hand over the, the full amount of the grant to the provider on the front end. They go do the work. They have two years to complete the work uh, uh, upon having a signed grant agreement with the state. 
and we check in with them regularly, uh, uh, provide continuous monitoring and oversight, and then they come get reimbursed for uh, for their investments from the grant programs. It's a very close working relationship. And so one of the questions that came in was, is Brightspeed involved? Brightspeed is uh, is a very active, or I guess will be a very active participant in the in the program. Yes. And you know, so I see you um, you know have a map of Okokok behind you. You know, I spent a lot of time at um, Hatteras uh, kiteboarding, and you know the challenge, especially anywhere in the Outer Banks, is it is very remote and it is very difficult. You know, in the off season to for you know the economic impact, you know, is pretty pretty tough on the the residents. But given broadband, if I look at just even our lake house in North Carolina, we used to only rent during the summer, and but with the pandemic, everybody wants to you know be able to be at the lake. I, I would think that you know the tourism, since uh, North Carolina is such a great tourism state with the mountains and the beach and everything you have there, that by getting broadband out to all these communities. That that would be allow a lot more people to spend time, you know, working from the beach and working from the lake and working from the mountains. Is that I mean, do you anticipate a big economic um, boost? Ab absolutely, I've got that Ocracoke Coke map up because I, I grew up in part on Ocracoke Coke and my dad's a Methodist minister, and so we kind of bounced around the state it's like being a military brat, but in half of North Carolina. And we spent three years uh, out there after he finished divinity school. And of course, as you say, you know, very different island uh, between uh, uh, May and September from the rest of the year, right? And, and I think that um, uh, having this connectivity, ha having uh, these uh, technology connections to uh, the rest of North Carolina and the rest of the country and the world and creates a huge number of op uh, opportunities for locals, whether it is uh, uh, folks renting, right, uh, uh, being attractive to uh, <laughs> me and my family wanting to go out there and work instead of sit in Raleigh uh, or, or anyone else to do that, but also supporting uh, local homegrown businesses, right? I mean, it, if you spent time on the Outer Banks, you know what a uh, a rich community of artists and yeah. uh, uh, small businesses, crafts, you know, that you've got there, uh, and, and all of those folks need that connection to market their work, sell, participate in e-commerce. And I think these investments can really be transformative on several levels, right? The, um, uh, letting attracting more folks to come attracting uh more employers but also supporting the folks who have, have kind of built uh built something locally i was in uh, a community a rural community in north carolina last week and they were talking about the chicken and egg problem of uh of uh having uh, attracting a large employer to a small um uh, relatively stagnant community and the problem of developing a workforce that would attract the employer in the first place and really for both of those you need uh serious infrastructure in place but also the right kind of programming and training built around it to to actually allow folks to, to thrive so uh yeah i think these you're, you're absolutely right and these these investments are are critical well even thinking about Ocracoke. You know, with the ferry getting wiped out with other hurricanes, you know, it goes from, you know, a 20 minute ferry to Hatteras Village to now it's like an hour and a half or so. So just being able to stay connected when the island changes, you know. Um, so again, Nate, really appreciate everything you're doing um, in, in North Carolina. And we look forward to seeing you in first quarter with our regional event. Um, so say hello to, um, Governor Cooper for us and uh, again we just appreciate the leadership and what your team's doing to close the digital divide in North Carolina. Thank I want you. to thank everybody for joining us today and we're going to get back together next Wednesday where we're going to be discussing broadband policy with Scott Walston, uh, the president and senior fellow of the Technology Policy Institute.
So you're not going to miss that. And we'll see you again next Wednesday. Thanks, everyone.